Hello and welcome to Brookwood Church. My name is Kevin Nunnery. I'm the high school pastor here. And on behalf of our entire team, thank you so much for joining us online to worship together. We're excited that we can encourage and engage with one another in this time. If you have friends who are unable to engage with us on Sundays, or if you just want to watch worship in the message again, we are broadcasting that on Wednesdays on our Facebook page. If this is your first time joining us, we would love to connect with you. If you would, just type new in the comments, or if you are on our online campus, just click the Connect With Us tab, or you can visit brookwoodchurch.org connect, and somebody will reach out to you soon. One of the many things I love about Brookwood is that we provide a variety of resources to supplement our teaching. If you go to the message resources area of our app or our online campus, you'll find a message guide as well as discussion questions that you can use to engage with your small group or just there in your family. And we also provide a family talk that has questions specifically geared for conversations with your children and students. During this time, as always, Brookwood is caring for others and bringing the gospel into our homes, community, and the world. If you'd like to support what we're doing here, you can give by going on our app, our website, or you can drop a check to the address on the screen. Thank you again so much for joining us today. It's my prayer for you and your family that you would experience the love of Christ and that as you listen for the Holy Spirit's guiding that he would speak to you. Thank you for joining us for the Brookwood Online Church Services. We're so glad you're with us. I invite you to worship with us, our great God, for who he is and what he's done for us. Let's sing this together. Here we go. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. And I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. shall come. Let's sing that together. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great you are then sings my soul my Savior God how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Great thou art, then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great You are. Let's continue in worshiping this morning. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own In brokenness and pain is all I know When I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power.
Why don't you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you, just as we sing, for your goodness, for your mercy, for your great love for us that you demonstrated through your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst, that you are alive and you're working you're on the move so God we thank you for what you're doing that you're drawing people to yourself God that you're healing people that you're making us more like your son so God thank you for including us in the work that you're doing thank you for changing us God we pray for these tithes and these offerings that you would take them and do with them what only you can do to make an impact in our city, in our state, in our nation, and in our world. We thank you for your move. We 
pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Psalms 133.1 says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. The New Living uses the word harmony. We're coming to you early this morning. We're recording this at 6 Sunday morning because we pre-record our messages that are telecast online because the situation that is occurring in our community and in our nation, protests locally, uh, violence, and vandalism in other places. And so what is our role and, and how should we think about it? We know that God wants for us to have peace. And yet this situation points out to us that there's not peace among all parts of our community. Obviously the divides appear to be more racial in this instance, but they're also cultural, they're ethnic, they're financial, they're educationally. There are many divisions in our nation. And so what are we to do? Well, we certainly pray because we don't have one common experience we find our unity only in our faith in Jesus Christ. So we pray. But we also ask God to show us ourselves. David asked God to examine his heart, and I'm asking God to examine my heart. And let's all do, because when we feel threatened, any of us, about any situation, we tend to become defensive and aggressive, which solves nothing. In this instance, let's avoid our preconceived ideas. Let's ask God to examine our hearts, examine our minds. But let's gain a perspective from someone with a different experience. Who do you know that you can talk with honestly, to, to really to listen, to gain some perspective on how people who have a different experience than you feel in this instance and why this senseless death of George Floyd has erupted in all of this, even chaos across the country. So let's ask questions, ask questions of God, ask questions of each other, gain some perspective, but then fall to prayer. Try fasting, pray more, You know, this coronavirus situation perhaps set us up for what's happening now, which is revealing the divisions in our community, in our churches, in our country. Let's pray. Let's take steps. Let's ask God to truly make us unified, that we would be God's people dwelling together in harmony. Thank you. Hey, I am so glad that you are here with me today, and I know that we are looking forward as we inch forward to the day that we can be here in person, but I'm glad that we can be here together over the online services, and I want to thank you for joining me. Today, we continue our series on the book of Ruth called Harvesting a Life of Hope, and we've been learning how to see God's fingerprints in our lives even when we don't hear his voice. In chapter one of Ruth, we saw that God is working in our crisis, that his fingerprints are always guiding us. And in chapter two of Ruth, we discovered how we can live a life of hope by recognizing God's provision for us and being grateful for that. So now in chapter three, we're going to explore how to harvest a life of hope through surrender. Now, I don't mean that kind of surrender where you kneel before an enemy army but a type of submission, a submission based on love and trust. And now, before you shut off the video, let me say this. I know that submission is not an easy word for us. 
And to be honest, I bristle a little when I hear that word too. But true biblical submission is not weakness and it's not oppression. It doesn't strip you of your identity or minimize who God created you to be. It's a willing surrender in order to embrace a more hope-filled future. And this kind of surrender, this kind of submission is not timid either. In fact, today we're going to talk about what it means to live in bold submission, bold submission. And hopefully at the end of this hour, we'll walk away with a different understanding of what the word submission means. Because seeking God with bold submission allows us to live a life of expectant hope. Let's see how that works. We are in Ruth chapter 3 this week, Ruth chapter 3. So go ahead and turn or swipe in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3. If you're watching in our online campus today, you can follow along by clicking the Bible tab in your chat window. And if you're watching on some other platform, that's okay too. You can follow along using the Brookwood Church app or just relax and we'll put the verses up on the screen for you and you can read them that way. And as you find that passage, Ruth chapter 3, let me remind you of what has happened so far. During a terrible famine in Israel, Elimelech and his wife Naomi run away from God's provision in Israel to Moab, an enemy country. Then Elimelech and both of his sons die, leaving Naomi and her two Moabite daughters-in-law. Now, one of those daughters-in-law goes back to her family, but Ruth stays with Naomi, dedicating her life to the God of Israel. So Ruth and Naomi, they travel back to Bethlehem, but they're destitute, right? Well, that is until God directs Ruth to an encounter with a man named Boaz. And he's a rich relative of their family, and he shows Ruth incredible favor. And then at the end of chapter 2, where we left off last week, we see a transition in Naomi when she finally realizes that God had directed them to Boaz, a family redeemer. She started out bitter, if you remember, but she begins to see how God has been working in their lives to rescue them, that his silent fingerprints have been guiding their story all along. And as Naomi has that transition, we now pick up in chapter three. So let's start right in verse one. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. So Naomi says Boaz is a close relative, and she's referring to what she said in the last chapter, which is that he carries the role of a family redeemer. So, so what is that? What's a family redeemer? The family redeemer, or what many call the kinsman redeemer, was a rescuer and a protector for the entire family. A relative who could restore a family's name by saving the land of a relative who had died, seeking justice on their behalf, even marrying the widow and carrying on a family legacy in a family name. And Boaz, the man that God introduced to Ruth, is one of these protectors, one of these men. Now, in these first few verses, we see more evidence of Naomi's transformation that started last week. First, the language that Naomi is using indicates that she's not treating Ruth as a daughter-in-law anymore. Instead, she's treating her as her own daughter. That's the same perfect acceptance that we saw from Boaz last week. And secondly, and even more importantly, if Naomi's hope is that Ruth will marry Boaz, it means she's giving up her own right to remarry. See, she could claim the family redeemer, the kinsman redeemer for herself, but instead we see her sacrificing her own restoration for Ruth. And this is a complete reversal from the attitude we saw from Naomi in chapter one, remember? Because when she was trying to send Ruth and Orpah away, Naomi was acting like, and I think she even believed, that she was sacrificing for them. But you remember her actions were actually rooted in her own hurt, in her own bitterness, and that actually put the girls in danger. But now that she's been transformed, now that she's seen the fingerprints of God working in her life, she sees and acts 
out a true act of sacrifice, a surrender based on love. And that's the kind of submission that we're talking about today. Because when we're transformed by the Spirit, we begin to look at the needs of others as greater than our own. Scripture tells us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you looking to the interest of the others. That's Philippians 2, 3 and 4. That's what we see from Naomi here. And that's what happens in our own lives as we surrender, as we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. He transforms our nature to see others with compassion. He teaches us how to see others through God's eyes instead of through our own. So what is Naomi's plan for Ruth? We pick up in the middle of verse 2. She says, Tonight Boaz will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until after he finishes eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. Okay, take a deep breath. I feel you getting nervous, even through the camera. At first read, this sounds kind of manipulative, doesn't it? It sounds like Naomi is coaching Ruth on how to seduce Boaz, but that's not what's happening at all. On the contrary, Naomi is actually teaching Ruth about the customs of Israel. This Israelite mother is teaching her Gentile daughter to know and understand the God of Israel. After her husband died, Ruth would have worn mourning clothes, M-O-U-R-N, mourning clothes, to declare her sorrow. And she would have done that for a period of time. So this idea of bathing and putting on nice clothes and perfume, that's about ending Ruth's period of mourning for her husband, Malon. Naomi is teaching her how to respectfully move forward in preparation for what God will do in the next season of her life and prepare her for a second husband according to the laws of the Torah. So how does Ruth respond? She says in verse 5, I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. She submits to Naomi's authority as her parent. And Naomi is teaching her how to respectfully submit to Boaz's authority as their kinsman redeemer. And that leads us to our first fill-in. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to earthly authority. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to earthly authority. Now, most believers can get their mind around the idea of submitting to God, at least intellectually. But we have a really hard time submitting to earthly authority, don't we? I know that this is a difficult topic because I know that every one of us knows someone, a person, an organization, even a church that has abused their authority. And maybe you've been mistreated even abused by someone in your life who was supposed to have authority over you. I have too. I'm sorry that you experienced that. That was not God's desire. And if you need someone to help you heal from that abuse, we want to walk with you. If you need to heal from that hurt, we have people in care ministries who want to walk alongside you and encourage you and build you up and find a path out of that pain. Because we know that their manipulation or their mistreatment of us is the reason that we misunderstand the word submission. But again, true biblical surrender isn't about weakness or erasing who you are. It's not about accepting injustice and it's not about accepting abuse. It's about measuring our own response, especially when we think the authority is wrong. Because the way we respond to earthly authority is a reflection of how we trust God's authority. I'm going to say that again. The way we respond to earthly authority is a reflection of our trust in God's authority. 
Romans 13.1 says this, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. When we dishonor those who are in authority over us, whether it's our parents or our spouse or church leadership or our government, we're, we're dishonoring God. Now, does that mean we stand for abusive injustice? Does it mean that we blindly follow ungodly behaviors of those in authority over us? Absolutely not. But it does mean that we address those issues with respect, honor, and integrity. Now, in this book, we only see one example where Ruth pushes back against someone in authority over her. Do you remember where that is? It's back in chapter one. It's when Naomi tells Ruth to go back to her family and go back to her false gods. Ruth knows God has called her to go with Naomi. But rather than getting self-righteous or prideful, she just comes boldly but humbly to challenge Naomi with respect, reverence, and honor. That's exactly what we're called to do. So we need to measure our words in person, but we especially need to do that online because that's the place where we all feel a little bit more free to be snarky sometimes, right? We all have to take this in. If you are putting up sarcastic memes or you're writing posts that tear down Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, or your ex-husband or wife, or your neighbor, or your kid's teacher, or the church leadership, if you're tearing down anyone on social media, you need to know that you are not defending God. You're disobeying him. God doesn't need us to defend his word. He needs us to live it out. Social media is one of the greatest mission fields we have right now. So we need to measure every post that we write against the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. And when we write that post and we look at it, if any of those words fall short on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control, if they fall short on any of those, we need to delete it. We need to get rid of it. And we should use that same editing technique with our tongue when we're talking someone face-to-face because we are called to be ambassadors of Christ, not ambassadors of our opinions. So how does that help us harvest a life of hope? It gives us hope because a humble attitude towards authority and really people in general helps us heal. It is impossible to live in the hope of Jesus Christ when we're focused on being right or pointing out that other people are wrong. Our opinions and our defensive nature are created through the lens of our own past painful experiences. See, the way we respond to authority now isn't about what the authority is doing now. It actually comes from how we were treated by authority in the past and how that made us feel in the moment. So what we do is we stew in our past hurts or in our offense rather than looking to God for the answers. Yes, always be safe, love justice, have healthy boundaries, but respond in love and compassion to those in authority as a reflection of Christ's love and compassion for you. Only then can we clearly see God's fingerprints in our lives and his guidance. Let's not be ruled by our emotions. Let's be ruled by God's wisdom and his grace. So we see in the text that Ruth changes out of her mourning clothes and she submits to the authority of Naomi and she goes down to the threshing floor. Let's continue in verse 7. Verse 7. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and he went to sleep. Now, some people read that part about him being in good spirits and they assume that Boaz was drunk, but there's nothing in the language here to indicate that. I think what we're supposed to take away from that passage is that Boaz is content. 
He's content. So what is this whole threshing floor scene? What is happening here? I, I want to give you a picture of what is happening. So here is a picture of the threshing floor. And what would happen is after the harvest, all the farmers would beat the sheaves of the grain to separate the grain from the straw. Then they'd use a, sh a shovel or a fork, a pitchfork, and they would throw it up in the air so that the wind would carry away the lighter chaff and the good grain would fall back to the ground. And they would do this over and over and over until they had pure grain with no impurities. And all the impurities had been blown away. And the reason Boaz is sleeping there is because the farmers would typically sleep at the threshing floor to protect their harvest from animals, but more from marauding thieves. So let's keep reading. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. I would be surprised by that too. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. I love that she says my. But it makes us a little nervous a little uncomfortable to read that, doesn't it? That seems very strange to us, that she would sneak in and uncover his feet. But make sure you get this. Ruth's actions here are bold, but they're not inappropriate. This is another section of this chapter that is commonly misunderstood. Some have even suggested, and you may read, that the phrase uncovered his feet, and I'll, I'll be delicate here, is, is a euphemism for a sexual act. And they think that because a similar phrase is used elsewhere in Scripture for that purpose. But here's the problem. This is a completely different form of that word. And more importantly, you would have to take this verse completely out of context in order to come to that conclusion. And I'll show you why when we get to verse 11. No, this is not an inappropriate action. This action is symbolic of Ruth submitting to the law of God and submitting to the protection of Boaz under the authority of God. And as she submits to Boaz here, she's actually submitting to God's authority. And that brings us to number two. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to God's authority. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to God's authority. And this picture, this is a, this is a beautiful moment where Ruth submits to the law of God, knowing that God and Boaz as a godly man can be trusted with her future. Now the phrase that she uses here, spread the corner of your covering over me, it literally translates spread your wings over me. And that language was typically used in marriage proposals, so there's no question that she's proposing here. But it also harkens back to the blessing Boaz pronounced over Ruth on the day that they met. Do you remember that from chapter 2? Boaz says, May the Lord, and he uses the personal name of God, may Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you've done. So by using those specific words, in, Essex, in, in essence, rather, Ruth is saying, I see Yahweh in you, Boaz. And I'm submitting to God's future for me, and I'm trusting you with that. That's beautiful. And that's the reason she can be so bold in her request. Because let's be honest, this is a pretty bold proposal, isn't it? This is a bold move that Ruth is doing. She is confident and she is clear. But again, Make sure you realize that she doesn't come with her copy of Leviticus and demand her rights saying, look, you have to take care of me. She doesn't come demanding what she thinks she deserves. Instead, she comes in humbly, knowing that she'll receive a grace greater than what she deserves. Don't miss this. Ruth can come boldly because she's submitting. See, when we submit to trusting the promises of God, we can come boldly before him and expectantly knowing that he will fulfill those promises. Surrendering to God's future for us isn't weak. 
it empowers us. It empowers us to claim his strength and his promises. Having a heart of bold submission allows us to live a life of expectant hope. And just like Ruth, we can come humbly and we can lay at the feet of Jesus Christ and still speak boldly of his promises to us, knowing that he will fulfill them. So we see Ruth in this text submit to earthly authority, both Naomi and Boaz, and to God's authority, his word. And how do we see Boaz respond? Verse 10. Boaz says, The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before. For you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now, don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary. For everyone in town knows that you are a virtuous woman. Virtuous woman, remember that. Now, keep in mind, Boaz is likely the same age as Naomi. They were contemporaries. Ruth was married to Malon for 10 years before he died, so we can guesstimate that she's in her late 20s, and Boaz is probably around 50, maybe even a little older. So when Boaz says, you could have gone for a younger man, he's actually pointing out her submission to God's authority. See, what he's saying is, Ruth, you could have left Naomi. You could have married into another family and sought your own security. But instead, you've chosen to honor your family and honor God by seeking a kinsman redeemer, following the commands of Yahweh. Remember, this is the time of the judges when this takes place, and that's a, a time of moral chaos and anarchy. Most of the Israelites have turned their back on God, yet here's this Gentile, this Gentile woman embracing the safety and provision of God's authority. And Boaz humbly honors God's authority as well. He says, I'm surprised that you would pick me, but I will do all that's required. Now, I want to go back to the end of verse 11 for a second because this is key. Boaz says, we'll put it back up. Everyone in town knows that you are a virtuous woman, a virtuous woman. This is so cool. I love this. And if you're a, a Bible nerd or a, a history nerd, you'll love this too. The phrase used here for virtuous woman is Isha Chayil. And that exact phrase is only used in one other book of the Bible the book of Proverbs. And some of you know where I'm going. It's used to describe, that phrase is used to describe the ideal godly woman. You see it in Proverbs 12, 4, and again in that well-known poem in Proverbs 31, the Proverbs 31 woman. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, that's okay. The poem outlines what a courageous, virtuous, strong, godly woman looks like. And it asks the question, it says, where can anyone find a woman like that? Now, in our Bible, in this Bible that we have, our Bible places the book of Ruth after the book of Judges just because of the chronology. But the ancient Hebrew Bible actually places Ruth directly after Proverbs, because they view Ruth as the answer to Proverbs' question. It's as if you were to read in Proverbs and say, where could anyone find such a godly woman? And you turn the page and you go, oh, there she is. It's Ruth. And in chapter 2 of Ruth, Boaz is called the Gebor Chael, which is the male version of that same phrase. And it means a mighty warrior valor, a, a man of God. So the author is boasting about the integrity of Ruth and Boaz. This is how we know that nothing immoral happened, nothing torrid happened at the threshing floor, because they're pointing out that these two people have such integrity in their love for God. But this rendezvous could have been disastrous, right? This scenario, we felt uncomfortable reading it because there is disaster written all over this. A midnight meeting out in the middle of a field? 
So many things could have gone wrong. Boaz could have been drunk. Many of the men there probably were. Ruth could have manipulated Boaz, even seduced him to get what she wanted. Boaz could have easily taken advantage of Ruth. Or Boaz could have rebuked her and sent her back out into the night where it wasn't safe. So many things could have gone wrong. But why wasn't it disastrous? It wasn't disastrous because they'd already submitted their hearts to God's authority before they got there. And why is that important to us? Because you will run into situations where the opportunity and the temptation to go against God's will for your life seems overwhelming. And our response in that moment greatly depends on our dedication to God's word and his authority before we enter the threshing floor. If we are in a deep, abiding relationship with God, when his authority becomes part of our character rather than a list of rules we're trying to follow, we stop focusing on the temptation that's all around us and we start seeing God's guidance everywhere around us in our lives. See, we won't have to decide to do the right thing in that moment because it will become part of who we are in Christ. So, this would be where we would expect that we say, so they got married and they lived happily and ever after, and that's the end of Ruth. But no, we have a wrinkle in the story. There's a wrinkle in our story, and we see it in verse 12. Verse 12, Boaz says this, But while it's true that I'm one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I'll go talk to him, and if he's willing to redeem you very well, let him marry you. But if he's not willing, then as sure as Yahweh lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. Boaz wants to marry Ruth. But according to the laws of the family redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, there's a relative closer to Elimelech than Boaz is. So in order for Boaz to marry Ruth, this other relative has to first relinquish his right. So here we see Boaz once again submitting to God's authority. He essentially says, Ruth, we, we need to do this the right way. And we need to trust God with the outcome. We need to trust that God is going to do the right thing in this. And that leads us to our last fill-in. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to God's plan and timing. We harvest a life of hope by submitting to God's plan and timing. Whew, this one is hard for me. I bet it's hard for you too. <laughs> On my better days, I only want God to tell me the future. On my worst days, I want to control the future. This is a difficult thing, right? Submitting to God's plan, his timing. But sometimes we have to surrender what we want to God, trusting that he knows the best outcome. Let's continue. Verse 14. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until morning, but she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. He measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. And then he returned to the town. Why does Boaz not send Ruth home after they finish talking? Why does he tell her to stay until morning? Was well, to protect her. Remember, this is a time of moral anarchy in Israel. The threshing floor was a place that was known for partying, basically, for prostitutes and drunkenness and immoral behavior. It was not safe to send Ruth back out into the night. So just as we saw in the last chapter, Boaz offers her protection and provision. And the reason that she leaves before daybreak is not because she has something to be ashamed of, but because Boaz wants to protect her reputation. And this brings up sort of a side note, but another important point in submitting to God. Romans 14 teaches us that we shouldn't do anything that might lead someone else down the wrong path. So even if we're on the up and up, like Ruth and Boaz here, we have to avoid things that can be misconstrued as ungodly. 
because it creates gossip and it ruins our witness for Christ. So Ruth goes home and we continue in verse 16. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? You can imagine she's been up all night wanting to know what happened. And Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. I love that. The last time we saw the word empty in this book was in chapter one, when Naomi says, God brought me back empty. She's not empty now. And then it says, then Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. She says, be patient and wait to see what happens. We can trust him to work this out. Naomi and Ruth and even Boaz are now in a position of letting God work out their fate. Do they have a preference? Yes. Have they made their preferences known? Yes. But ultimately, the only way we harvest a life of hope is trusting God's plan and his timing. And that leaves us with a cliffhanger at the end of chapter 3. Who will marry Ruth? Well, next time that we're together, we're going to see how trusting God today is going to change their family for generations to come and even changes your life. You know, a, a lot of people have been struggling with surrendering their todays during the uncertainty of this pandemic. But anxiety steals our hope because it tricks us into believing that we're responsible for the outcome. And I personally know, I know that crippling feeling of anxiety it was debilitating in my life for many years. I needed to surrender to God. Because surrendering to God, again, it's not about oppression. It's about hope and security. The real oppression is desperately trying to control things when we know that we can't. Worry is a form of praying to ourselves knowing that we can't answer. Aren't you tired of fighting for control every day. Doesn't that wear you out? But when we give up that control, when we humbly come and lay at the feet of Jesus Christ and boldly say, cover me with your wings. I trust you with my today. I trust you with my future. When we ask Christ to cover us with our wings, then we can claim the promises of God. And scripture promises he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. The plague doesn't that sound like a promise we need today? God is the answer to our anxiety. God is the answer to our fear. We need only exchange our false sense of control for his grace and come under his wings. Let's pray. Father God, I have such a hard time giving up control. I have such a hard time submitting. And I, Lord, I, pr I pray for me and I pray for those watching that you would show us and remind us and help us experience. So it's not just intellectual. Help us experience that submission is empowering, that it gives us access to your strength and your power and your wisdom and your providence. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who sees us, that you are a God who heals. And we give you praise, knowing that you will not leave us where we are and that we can come to the threshing floor and we can have all of our impurities removed and that we can trust you with our today and our future. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And hey, before you go, a couple very, very important things. First uh, is don't forget to go on our Facebook post. Uh, we've been putting a God's fingerprint post up every week, and we want you to put up pictures or videos, something that shows us and shares with everyone how you see God's fingerprints in your lives. And if you're on something other than Facebook, uh, use the hashtag God's fingerprints and tag at Brookwood Church. But even more importantly, how excited are we that some of us are going to be able to come back together and worship together in person next week, but it's going to look different. I'm excited to be there. I can't wait to see some of you there. But it's going to look different. And uh, right after I stop talking, our senior pastor, Perry Duggar, is going to tell you what that looks like. So stay tuned and thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us today for our online service. Through the story of Ruth, Josh has encouraged us to find hope by surrendering our lives to God's plan, trusting Him to handle our present and our future situations. We'll begin meeting on site for worship services beginning next Sunday, June 7th. And we'll continue also meeting here online as well. Due to social distancing, seating will be limited in each service. So we need for each person to be registered for the service they would like to attend. Registration of every person, including children and guests, enables us to determine how many services we need to accommodate everyone who is ready to return for on-site worship. Registration begins today at 1 p.m. on our website or also on the Brookwood Church app, and it closes on Thursday evening at midnight. You should receive an email today with the registration link, as well as a video of what to expect on June 7th. You can visit our Back to Church page for all the details regarding our on-site services and help you decide which campus, whether on-site or online, is best for you, your family, and your guests. The pastors and staff are available to serve you. So please feel free to contact us either through email or by calling our main number, which appears here on screen. You can also visit our website, to learn ways to serve and give and get connected. Remember, we are the church, no matter where, how, or when we meet. See you next time. Store me, you restore me, so I